On this episode of Uncle Scott's Pancast Podcast, we are going to talk paella. Been making a lot of paella lately. We've got some viewer feedback on that paella pan I reviewed. We've got a few paella tips and tricks. We're going to talk seasoning, carbon steel paella pans, and more. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast Podcast. I have been on a paella frenzy, a paella journey these days. I've been going kind of paella crazy, not to over-dramatize it, since buying and reviewing this uh, Debouillet carbon steel paella pan. I got a lot of feedback on that review and some people sent in some tips. And I'm going to go ahead and put out the call. I need more paella tips. I was new to paella when I bought this pan, getting just a little bit of skill developed, but there is a ton more to learn. I would say my first few paellas, I give them a grade of C maybe, and now I'd say I'm up to a solid B. Need to get up to that A minus, A, A plus range. So if you have any paella tips, I am looking for all the help I can get. Now I put up a poll the other day and asked you guys if you have ever made paella. And it turns out over 250 people responded to the poll and 77% of you guys have never made paella. 23% have, so that's roughly one in four, one in five have tried it, but almost, almost 80% haven't. So if you have not tried paella, I highly encourage you to do so. It's delicious. And for the longest time, I had never tried making paella myself, and I always thought it was some sort of seafood stew, and it never really interested me. I got online and I, I'm always looking up information about frying pans and these paella pans kept popping up and they looked interesting. So I, I kind of got drawn to it just by buying the pan. And if you're going to review a paella pan, you got to learn to make paella. But it turns out it's absolutely delicious. It's not a seafood stew. It is a rice dish. And there are land-based versions which have kind of meat along with the rice and there are sea-based versions that have kind of seafood and shellfish along with the rice. I tend to go to more towards the, the land-based. And if you like chicken and rice, and who doesn't like chicken and rice, then you'll probably like paella. It's a rice dish with chicken. So just get um, a pan and get started. I highly encourage people to try it. Yes. Got an email from ES. And this is an example of what I really like about Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Get feedback and advice from people great people all over the world. He says part of his heritage is Spanish. He's made paella countless times going back to the 1980s. So when I hear that, my, uh, my ears perk up. I'm going to get some good tips here. He says he doesn't like the recipes that have too many different ingredients. He likes to keep it simple. Um, he says he generally uses no more than two meats. So for example, if he's making the chicken one, he'll use chicken and Spanish chorizo sausage. And immediately... I knew that was good advice. I don't know why I had read about Spanish chorizo. When I made a couple of my early ones, I used smoked sausage just because that's what I had. But sometimes those things that almost go without saying, when I'm new to something, I need someone to tell me the things that go without saying. So that chorizo, I'm definitely gonna use the chorizo next. And he uses onion, garlic, pimento, uh, roasted and peeled red peppers. And then he says he uses a legume like peas. Uh, I've seen people use peas and I use some fresh peas in uh, one of my paellas, but he also uses garbanzo beans. So I haven't tried that. And he uses a charcoal, hardwood charcoal fire with wood flavor, he uses some oak or mesquite. Now here in Utah, it was 104 degrees the other day. A little bit difficult just physically to get outside and sit by a hot fire and cook. So I've been making mine on the uh, stovetop, but I think definitely hardwood charcoal and that uh, legitimate wood smoke is probably the way to go if you can do it. And he also says he finishes his off with aioli, a garlic mayonnaise. So that sounds pretty good. I have not heard of that before. So that is definitely something to try. Someone named, I'm going to mispronounce this, Giel Bimo sent in a link to a video here on YouTube, another paella video. This one is kind of an authentic Spanish video. It's in Spanish with uh, English subtitles. I'll put a link to this below. And it kind of goes through how to make the traditional Spanish Valencian paella. And he says, just one tip 
never mix seafood and meat in the same paella. I'm gonna contrast that with a Jacques Pepin video that the algorithm serviced to me the other day. He made paella, and in his, he kind of put everything in there. He put not only the chicken and the sausage, but he also put uh, shellfish and seafood in there. So he mixed his and did not seem to worry about the socarat. And if you're new, the socarat is kind of some slightly caramelized, slightly crispy layer of rice on the bottom of the pan that develops after you've cooked the paella. Um, Jacques Pepin didn't mention anything about the socarat. The traditional Spanish video did talk about the socarat. So two kind of opposing styles of paella there, but I'll put links to both of those videos below. See paella rice, um, in the review video, I was using some Rey del Arroz. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Spanish bomba rice that I got off of Amazon. I did find some in a local grocery store. So um, I've been using this recently, this Matisse paella rice, also from Spain. I think the rice is slightly important. I think it's important to get that authentic Spanish rice. But as far as the brands and different ones, I haven't found a whole lot of difference between the Spanish rices that I have tried. In the review video, in the Valencian paella that I made, I put rosemary in my paella. There's been a little bit of back and forth going on between, um, again, Gil Bimo and Jay Stones. Uh, Jay Stones said that the rosemary is a bit untraditional. Uh, Gil Bimo said it is kind of traditional. I tend to really, really like rosemary. There was an old ACDC song, Whole Lot of Rosie. If I were to redo that song, it would be a whole lot of rosemary. I love rosemary, especially with chicken. I kind of boiled some rosemary in with the uh, rice as it simmered. And then at the end, what I did yesterday is something I kind of did. I don't know if anybody remembers, I did that chickpea, Italian chickpea soup recipe a few years ago. And at the end of that, we kind of took some olive oil and some garlic and some rosemary and kind of uh, sauteed that just a little bit and made some infused uh, olive oil to kind of finish off that soup. I did a similar thing with my paella yesterday, except I didn't put the garlic in there. I uh, sauteed a little bit of rosemary in there and used that as kind of a finishing oil for the paella. I thought it was really, really good. But it seems like with the tip from ES about the uh, garlic aioli or the the infused olive oil here. It does kind of help it to give it a little kick at the end to kind of finish it off with something really, really flavorful right at the end. And on this one I made on the stove top, I reserved some of my green beans and red peppers and tried to make a little bit of a pinwheel design on top. I thought it was kind of neat. My wife thought I was nuts sitting there rearranging green beans. But I thought it was kind of neat. So you can get kind of creative with not only the ingredients, but the way they look too. Uh, Michael Smith has some good tips. He wrote in, he says, to give you a bit of a hack, next time use four to five lines of Spanish chorizo, again with the, with the uh, chorizo tip. Definitely gonna try chorizo next time. He says, fry it in oil first to turn the oil red. Then you can add it at the very end with the peas. So that's pretty neat. He says, you can also add about one tablespoon of smoked sweet paprika. Then that with the saffron will really turn the rice yellowish orange. Um, I think that's a really good tip here because saffron, it's ridiculously expensive. Um, definitely pound by pound, pound for pound is the most expensive ingredient in this, but you don't want to use 10, 12, $15 worth of saffron to cook, you know, $2 of rice and $8 worth of chicken. So the saffron is very expensive. And if you can kind of use that smoked sweet paprika to kind of extend a little bit of saffron, that might be a good money saving tip. Next, let's talk a little bit about this Debouillé pan that I reviewed. And I got a couple of uh, comments on that. Uncool Dad. Now, if you want to talk about somebody in the sweet spot of the Uncle Scott's Kitchen target market, someone named Uncool Dad, right there in the meaty part of the bell curve. He says, this is not a paella pan. Paella pans have some specific properties and they're a little bit thinner and they're usually wider and shallower. Okay, so I think those are fair points. This is my first paella pan, but just comparing this one to some of the other ones I have seen online, a lot of the other ones are a little bit wider and a little bit shallower. And really what this one is, and I think I called this out in the video, this is a little bit more of a mineral bee frying pan kind of modified to be a paella pan rather than a dedicated paella pan. Now these are all nuances and kind of variations on a theme. 
But one thing I do like about this Dubouille, as far as the size, this size fits well on a stovetop burner. So if you're gonna be making paella at home on your stovetop, I think this is a pretty good size to get. This one is a 12 and a half inch wide pan. So in terms of frying pans, a very big pan. In terms of paella pans, actually relatively small. Now I do have, this is a Moviel 14 inch carbon steel skillet. So not a paella pan, but the same thing, just with different handles. And what I gotta say about this thing is, once you get bigger than this 12 and a half inch, you get to these 14 inch, these things are huge. This one, I cannot get in my oven without, and get the door shut with that handle, but they're really difficult to get on a burner. You gotta have a huge burner. And even then you got to be very careful not to get a hot spot in the middle and have that cooler edge around, cooler ring around the edge. So in terms of paella pans, I totally get it. 14, 17, 22 inch pans. If you're gonna get one of those, I think those are more for barbecue grills or cooking outside. Those are gonna be really difficult to use on a stovetop. Now, some people say you can get them where you can just kind of overlap two burners. But if you do that, you're gonna really need to be on top of things because then you might have two hot spots and two cold spots. That being said though, I am kind of getting into learning all this paella and to my wife's chagrin, I might be adding some more paella pans. So I'm gonna start with this one. This one is working fantastically and I may try some of the bigger, wider, more traditional ones too and see how that goes. Now, even though this is relatively small for a paella pan, I did want to touch on the uh, capacity of this pan. I don't think I mentioned that in the review video. Uh, the other day I made paella in this thing. I had a pound of meat, I browned a pound of meat in there, had an entire red pepper, an entire onion, I had two cups of dry rice, and I had about four and a half cups of liquid and an entire can of tomatoes. And that all fit in here pretty well. So in terms of capacity and size, this thing did make enough paella for three or four adults. Now, if you're making a big event, uh, party style paella, and you're gonna have eight or 10 people over, definitely need a bigger pan. Three to four people cooking on a stovetop inside, I think this one worked just fine. Now, I also wanna to touch on the seasoning for this uh, skillet. This is a carbon steel skillet. We talk a lot about seasoning carbon steel around here. One of the things we've always said though is not to cook acidic ingredients in carbon steel skillets. Uh, the traditional paella pans are carbon steel and every recipe I see has tomatoes in it. Tomatoes are acidic. Uh, someone named The Game wrote in and asked, when you finish cooking with a pan like this, do you need to re-season it? And here I wanna kind of drill down on this just a little bit more. I put up that review, or it wasn't a review, it was a how-to video on how to uh, strip seasoning and how to nuke and reset your uh, carbon steel and reseason it. In that video, I showed stripping seasoning off a carbon steel skillet by simply simmering a can of tomatoes in it. It will strip the seasoning off to bare metal. Yet these paella recipes all use tomatoes and this pan is not stripped to the bare metal. So what gives there? I have a theory on this. I'm not a scientist, but here's what I think is happening. If you take something acidic like tomatoes or vinegar, put that directly in the carbon steel and cook that, it's going to take all your seasoning off down to the bare metal. Now we simmered those tomatoes in that video for I think 20 or 25 minutes. That was tomatoes directly on the carbon steel. I've been making a bunch of paella in this guy. You can definitely see a ring around. The seasoning is darker towards the top. And you can see a ring where it's a little bit lighter that indicates where the level of liquid was in the pan, but there's still some seasoning on here. It's definitely lighter, but there's still some on there. It doesn't strip all the way down to the bare metal. What I think is happening when I make paella, I start out, instead of putting tomatoes directly in the carbon steel, I start out by browning meat. I brown the chicken and oil, the pan is hot, so you get some oil on there. I think maybe that gives it just a little bit of layer of protection there. And then when I add the tomatoes, for example, in these paellas, I had four and a half cups of liquid in the pan before I added the tomatoes. I think they're getting diluted down and not really interacting with the seasoning quite as much as when we put those tomatoes in directly. Um, so you got some oil, the pan is already hot, you brown some meat, and then you add liquid, and I think there's some oil that kind of diffuses into the liquid 
and then the tomatoes go in and I think they really get diluted down and don't do quite as much damage to the seasoning, if you will. Now, we're kind of nuts about seasoning around here anyway, and I think this kind of makes an argument for having more than one carbon steel skillet. Um, most of my carbon steel skillets, I really worry and pay attention to the seasoning. On this one, on the paella pan, because it's a traditional paella pan and the recipes use tomatoes, I'm going to try, as hard as it is for me to say this, I'm going to try and just not worry about the seasoning too much in the paella pan and see what happens. I don't know. Tough to say. Now for the 77% of you guys who have not tried making paella, I do want to encourage you to give it a try. You do not have to have a paella pan. You could do it in a cast iron skillet. You could even just do it in a stainless steel skillet. So don't let lack of a paella pan dissuade you from giving this a try. And now here I want to ask for tips on the socarat. If any of you guys are experts on the socarat, that kind of layer of slightly caramelized, slightly chewy, brown ri browned rice at the bottom, um, I've had kind of mixed results here. Um, some, sometimes there's a lot of socarat, but it's really kind of stuck on there and I got to scrape it out. Is that something, is that normal to need to scrape it out of there or should it release easily? Um, different recipes, I've seen that when the, the paella is done, they'll cover it either with aluminum foil or a towel and move it off the burner. Do I need to do the socarat, kind of put it on the higher flame before doing that, and then that softens it up so it's easier to dip out of the pan? Or do you cover it and let it finish there, remove the cover, and then put it back on a high flame for a minute or two to try and get the socarat right at the end? If anybody has socarat advice, I am all ears. Well, I think that about wraps it up for our paella discussion for today. If you haven't tried it, highly encourage you to give it a try. It's basically chicken and rice. There's only so wrong you can go. Chicken and rice is delicious. And then you build a few skills and go from there. But I am on my paella journey, not to over-dramatize it too much, but having a great time learning this traditional Spanish dish. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast.